and thank you for joining today's Chain Reaction Research webinar, Why Cross-Commodity Policies Are Critical to Ending Southeast Asia Deforestation. Chain Reaction Research is glad you were able to join today and help us discuss our recent report titled Lack of Cross-Commodity NDPE Implementation Allows Deforestation. This is the report and the rest of our analysis is available to download from our website, chainreactionresearch.com. Chain Reaction Research is a consortium partnership between Profundo Aid Environment and Climate Advisors. Together, we conduct sustainability risk analysis, demonstrating that net deforestation is material financial risk for important commodities like palm oil, soy, cattle, coffee, cacao, timber, pulp, and paper. Before we get to the presentation, we'll go over a few of our ground rules and some introductions. My name is Kyle Saukas of Climate Advisors, and I'll be moderating today, joined by Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment. Okita Moranigam of Aid Environment, who will help answer questions at the end of the session, Gerard Reich of Profundo, and our guest, Rob Kobier of the Earthworm Foundation. During the webinar, all attendee lines will be muted. We encourage you to use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom window throughout the webinar to ask questions. We have reserved the final part of this webinar to answer these questions and continue our discussion. Lastly, all registrants of this webinar will receive a link to the recording within the next few days. And with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to our first presenter of the day, Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment. Hi, thanks, Carl. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the application of no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation policies, and why we believe they should be extended across commodities. Next slide. So NDP policies now dominate the palm oil sector. Um, analysis that CRR did um, a couple of years ago um, calculated that 83% of refining capacity in Indonesia and Malaysia, which is where most refining of palm oil takes place, are covered by NDP policies. And they now dominate the upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors with most large companies having um, a policy that um, forbids um, deforestation and development of peat and exploitation. One of the things that's um, key to understand about NDP policies is that they're typically only applied at the palm oil level. So if there's deforestation for oil palm in a supply chain, the NDP policy will be enforced. But if the deforestation is detected is for another commodity, even if it's by the same company, it falls outside of the scope of the policy. Um, and if you want an example of that, you can just look at the um, grievance list of most of the main traders. They will often have examples of a case of deforestation that they have investigated and they have, through their investigations, um, under, uh, um, uncovered that the deforestation is not for oil palm, therefore they won't do anything about it. That supply will remain in the supply chain and just because the deforestation is not for palm oil, it's, it's, it's just not really considered as part of the policy. That means that a lot of deforestation in companies are still finding buyers in the palm oil sector. And NDP covered supply chains, which are should be deforestation free, which are often claimed to be deforestation free, are not in fact deforestation free. They may be free of deforestation for oil palm, but the companies within those supply chains are clearing forest. It's just not for oil palm, so it doesn't fall within the scope of the policy. Um, in Indonesia, you'll, you most often see this um, in the industrial forest sector, so the Hattie sector, which is often um, referred to. You will sometimes see it in mining and in other commodities, but it's most common in these two sectors. And in Indonesia, 64% of all industrial forest plantation permits are held by company groups that also grow oil palm. You see it a lot in Sarawak as well, where the six largest companies in oil palm plantation development are believed to hold 69% of Sarawak's industrial tree or forest plantation concessions. There's a lot of overlap between industrial forest and oil palm sectors, and the concessions are often very close to each other. If you go anywhere in Indonesia, you'll often be on the road in between an oil palm concession and an industrial forest concession. So eucalyptus, acacia, rubber, plywood tree species, and they'll be operated by the same company. Next slide. 
And this is just an example of some of the key companies that you might know that operate in both sectors. So Royal Gordon Eagle, you'll often know it. Um, in the palm oil sector is Asian Agri or Apical. In the timber sector, it's April. Jarum, again, operates in both sectors. It's very, very common. If you look at the supply, supply lists and mill lists of the companies that publish them, the main palm oil buyers, a lot of the companies that you see in there will also be operating in the industrial tree sector. Next slide. This is an example of, of a company that is problematic and we believe is an example of, of why NDP policy should be applied across commodity. So Jarum, a very well-known Indonesian company, famous for its cigarettes, um, it operates in oil palm concessions and in timber concessions. Jaram cleared over 10,000 hectares of forests between 2016 and March 2021 on their industrial tree plantations. They've since stopped clearing, but there was huge amounts of deforestation that was covered um, quite extensively by NGOs within Indonesia and internationally and within uh, the media in uh, Indonesia. If you've been working in this sector in the last few years, Jarum is a case of deforestation that you would likely have heard of. Um, Origa Nusantara um, filed a complaint with Jarum, um, with the Forest Stewardship Council against Jarum. And then in December 2020, rather than contesting it, Jarum withdrew its um, certification from the FSC. So this is a really well known case of, uh, of a company in the industrial forest sector with very well-known deforestation that had all kinds of sustainability problems that violated NDP policy. There's a company that shouldn't have been in NDP supply chains, but it sells to most of the, the industry's large buyers. And when pressed about this company, the response was, it's not for palm oil. The Yes, Jaron is a company that's clearing forest. It's not clearing it for oil palm. So it falls outside of the scope of our of our, of our palm oil policy. Next slide. So if you look at the case of Jarum, and there's numerous examples that you can use, we believe that it's necessary for the scope of NDP policies to be expanded. So they don't just focus on oil palm, they focus on every commodity that, you're, that a, a palm oil buyers, suppliers are operating in. And we've been talking to companies in different parts of the sector about this for a long time. There are numerous challenges to expanding the scope of, of policies that we acknowledge. Um, the one that you often see is that the different sectors that a company operates in will be under different management. Um, this makes engagement very difficult. If you go to your um, palm oil supplier and talk about a different part of their business, they will often just say that we have no um, influence over that as a different part of, of the business. You heard that argument when NDP policies came in, when um, they were first applied at mill level, and then many organizations advocated them being um, applied at company level. So that's a challenge, it's not insurmountable, but it's one challenge that you often see. You often see that demand for cross-commodity policies are considerably low. It's at the moment being led by NGOs and some, some downstream buyers, but largely by civil society and NGOs. Um, and verification is, is more difficult for issues outside of the commodity that the company is directly sourcing from. If you're buying palm oil, then you have um, influence over your supplier. You can talk to them about the supply, you can talk to them about due diligence activities you have. When it's about another commodity, then it's obviously much more difficult. However, as well as these challenges, there are lots of opportunities for um, NDV policies to be expanded. There's a big discussion at the moment about what is a company group. Um, that's being driven by civil society, by many different organizations, by the RSPO, which is currently assessing a couple of complaints that um, refer to companies um, that may be, may be operating through other companies that appear to be linked to, but we can't really prove it. And there's a lot, lots of discussion about um, what sort of framework should be used to define a company group. This is obviously very relevant to it because you're looking at an entire company's operations and not just one 
branch of that company. There are opportunities for all stakeholders in the sector to embrace these policies. NDP policies came in and were originally adopted by the midstream. Then it was taken up by upstream, then by downstream. There's lots of opportunities now for financial institutions to um, start looking at cross-commodity application of policies. One of the things that's quite key if you're talking about the industrial forest sector is that it's relatively easy to detect um, deforestation in that sector. Any responsible palm oil buyer will already be monitoring industrial forest and logging concessions because they operate in the same landscapes as, as all the palm plantations. So the provider that um, a company works with will be picking up the deforestation and they'll just be excluding it because it's not for oil palm, but it's very, very easy to detect deforestation on timber and industrial forest concessions. Um, and it's just a basic question that NDP policies were implemented, adopted and implemented because palm oil buyers didn't want deforestation in their supply chains. If you're buying from a company that's clearing forests, you have deforestation in your supply chain. Yes, it might be for a different commodity and you can perhaps justify it. But when you talk to companies, when you talk to consumers, it clearly violates the sort of ethos of an NDP policy, which is that there shouldn't be deforestation. And to claim that your supply chain is deforestation free, it has to consider all the commodities that your suppliers are operating in. Next slide. And there is precedent for cross-commodity application policies. Um, there's, there's a couple of others that are already sort of in the public domain of logging concessions in Sarawak that have been excluded from oil palm um, supply chains because of deforestation. Mining companies in Sumatra that have had pressure applied to them um, by palm oil buyers um, because of deforestation and the risk to reputation of the, of the palm oil buyers. And United Malacca, uh, palm oil, a Malaysian palm oil company, um, a few years ago was planning to develop a 60,000 hectare industrial tree concession in Sulawesi um, via its subsidiary PT1 of Rindang Lestari. They plan to clear the concession of its native vegetation, which is what happens on industrial forest concessions. And this would have violated the NDP policies of its palm oil buyers. Yes, they weren't planning on planting oil palm. It wouldn't have been for a palm oil concession. So it did officially fall outside of the scope of NDP policies. But some palm oil buyers understood that this presented a risk to their reputation, to how they implemented their NDP policy. And as a result of continuous engagement from buyers and NGOs, in September 2020, United Malacca issued a stop work order on that concession in Sulawesi and said that further development would be put on hold until an HCB assessment was completed. Um, there still hasn't been any development on the concession. We don't know what the plans are, but so far the forest on that concession remains present and safe. And that's because of the pressure that was applied largely by palm oil buyers who understood that this development caught, you know, created a reputational and policy application risk for their business. And we argue that this approach should be expanded and applied in every case. And by doing this, you can save more forest. Um, so thank you, I'll pass on to my colleague now. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, i like to discuss the, uh, the status of cross-commodity policies in the various levels of the uh, palm oil supply chain and the financial risks. Next slide, please. Uh, first uh, important point, um, cross-commodity NDP is not a multi-commodity policy as a multi-commodity policy, so one for palm, one for beef, one for pulp, etc., refers to the buyer's own supply chain in every commodity mentioned. Secondly, the overlap. Chris already pointed out the enormous overlap from palm to timber, the timber, but uh, but of the but of the top ten palm oil companies, six are also active in mining. This means that deforesters for mining activities can still sell palm to fast moving consumer good companies or traders with an NDPE palm policy. This would be an inconvenient position for these fast moving consumer goods companies and, uh, and for palm oil traders. Thirdly, 
history tells us that there have been successful cross-commodity actions by some palm oil buyers, but also many neglected ones. And that is the big problem and the financial risk. Uh, next slide, please. And what about EU regulations, European Union regulations, initiatives like the RSPO and codes of conduct? Do they take care of the cross-commodity and DPE issue? Well, the European Union regulations are very much focused on the part of the supply chain in the own region. So not in Southeast Asia. The European Union import part and part of the downstream get a lot of attention when talking about scope, but not the upstream. And the same is true for UK and US uh, regulations. RSPO uses group level. Uh, Chris already mentioned uh, this, that there is a discussion going on, but for a crucial cross commodity and the PE policy impact, the currently the, 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 the current definitions are just too vague. And also the other initiatives like the uh, accountability framework initiative and the company's code of conduct uh, are still, they lack a, a lot of, uh, uh, they, they are not explicit in, on cross commodity uh, in their cross commodity remarks. So that could be improved much further. Uh, next slide, please. Because of this policy gap, the whole palm oil supply chain, which is, by the way, quite successful in banning out deforestation, can be affected by deforestation in other non-palm or non-palm activities of their palm oil trading partners. The graph shows the crucial supply chain levels. Um, in this presentation, we will discuss the position of midstream companies, traders, processors, and uh, fast moving consumer good companies uh, of retailers, fast food companies, and last but not least, finances, which are not on the sheet, but which are of course financing every part of this, uh, uh, every level in this uh, supply chain. Um, an interesting observation is that 16, 16 out of 21 leading palm oil plantations have an NDP policy versus only three out of the 21 leading tree growers or timber companies. In mining, there is no uh, NDPE policy, zero. These numbers and the success of reducing deforestation in palm emphasizes the crucial position of, palm oil, of the palm oil chain. Uh, and also that the palm oil chain can be leading in cross commodity policy uh, implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, refineries and oligochemical companies have a crucial position as for instance, the top 11 companies see approximately 68%, so nearly 70% of all the crude palm oil and crude and, and kernel palm oil volumes going through their hands. That's a very high percentage. Uh, while they have all quite a good NDPE policy, there is a lack of cross-commodity NDP policy in this group with fakeness over definition of group level and even statements that only the palm oil relation is subject to NDPE policy. Now and then, some companies are reactive in cross-commodity issues via their grievance process and, and which are often incentivized by NGOs and civil society. Uh, the problem in this group is the current lack of leadership uh, by Wilmar, uh, as well as the strong increase of the biofuel segment. And clients in the biofuel segment, the problem is that they don't ask questions. Next slide, please. The fast moving consumer good companies, they have clearly less individual leverage than the refineries and the oleochemicals, but the top 30 still is, is still responsible for nearly 10% of the whole crude palm oil and 
KPO market demand. Also in this group, we see a struggle. We investigated 30 fast moving consumer good companies. So this is all what you see on the screen is only a selection. Uh, in this group, we see, the we, see, we see the struggle with the company-wide definition of their suppliers. Codes of conduct, which are quite popular in this group for reputation reasons, lack detail on cross-commodity NDP. Yes, reputation is an important driver of palm oil NDP and codes of conduct. And therefore, fast-moving consumer goods companies could could, uh, could be very sensitive for cross-commodity NDP risk. and well, could be incentivized to take action. Again, the large leader in, in which is facing consumers, which has an enormous consumer good uh, business, uh, Wilmar, remains quiet. But another one, the, the number two in the in the in the group, Unilever, has included cross commodity NDPE. Some others have made their first steps and might follow in the future with civil society pressure continuing. And uh, next slide, please. Then the retailers, the retailers and the fast food companies are far behind in just simple NDPE policies, which of course is a bad starting point for cross commodity NDPE policies. Moreover, the leadership leverage for any group is not present. The top 11 only accounts for 0.9% indirectly and directly of the CPO and KPO volumes worldwide. Uh, and companies also easily hide behind their private labels and tell us that they have no impact on the large, big, uh, large brands. Um, next slide, please. Well, last but not least, and last in the, in, in the row that we discuss are the finances. And these finances, they include banks, which provide loans, and investors who buy shares and who buy uh, bonds. Well, the situation is dramatic. Um, Forest and Finance database uh, has 3,000 finances in its database. And they investigated uh, 200 of them on their policies. And of these 200, uh, only three had some form uh, and often fake, uh, of a cross-commodity approach. That is what, that's only 1.5% of the finances of this selected group. This small group provides 4.8% of the bank loans and only 0.6, so less than 1% of the investments. However, the table suggests that palm oil finances might have quite some leverage over the financing uh, versus uh, versus pulp and paper, uh, timber and mining. Note that 49%, you can see that in the second column, uh, of identified financing is, uh, is for palm oil activities, and that's much more than for the other activities. However, a large hurdle is that Asian banks, with a lack of NDP policies, increasingly dominate the financing of the companies. Currently, that is around 70% uh, of uh, palm oil financing. Next slide, please. Uh, this leads me to the, to, to the last sheet. Uh, and the narrative is often implementation and verification of an NDP policy is expensive and with cross commodity even more expensive. Well, this is simply not true. If you buy certified palm oil with a premium and you introduce a cross-commodity NDPE policy for paper and pulp, but you do not buy paper and pulp of that specific supplier, then you, then you also do not need to pay a premium uh, uh, to pay a price premium for certified uh, pulp and paper. And yes, of course, different commodities chains ask for different monitoring costs, but digitalization, a difficult word, and corporations can read and, and corporations between companies can reduce costs dramatically. And note that the largest part of the value is earned downstream, a group that could easily share in the extra costs. 
this might only have a low single digit impact on the cost of the of a product and of the cost to the consumer in the supermarket. Uh, the risk is that no action, in particular for fast moving consumer good companies, will be much more expensive as reputation value is much larger than the tiny NDPE costs and even much larger than the present value of these costs. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Rob for his part of the presentation. Thanks very much, Sarad, um, and thanks to Chain Reaction for inviting me to join the webinar. Uh, so my name is Rob Collier. I work for Earthworm Foundation. I've been working in palm oil supply chains for over eight years now in the upstream and downstream. But today my role is primarily actually helping Earthworm members to respond to the campaigns like Chain Reactions and, and, and other similar NGOs, trying to respond productively and obviously find solutions. Um, that's been primarily in palm, but now is expanding more to to encompass other commodities. So this topic is particularly relevant to me today. So yeah, so thanks again. Next slide, please. So just very quickly about Earthworm Foundation. Um, as maybe a lot of you know, we used to be called the Forest Trust. And we've been going since 1999. And without going into all the details of what all the work we do, it's also primarily a field-based organisation. And I think most relevant to today. There's sort of two principles I think that underpin all our work. And one is to understand the lived reality on the ground as the heart of any solution. And the other is that all actors in the supply chain have a responsibility. Um, and what we find is, you know, for those downstream or brand companies we work with, the challenge is to bridge the gap between that lived reality on the ground and, you know, their position several stages of a supply chain. And you might argue that a cross commodity approach you know, if anything, is a further complication. So I'll touch on um, so the, you know, the attitude to cross commodity of downstream and brand companies, um, look at why it's not really necessarily taken root yet. You know, obviously Unilever accepted, um, but what actually has already started to happen and what can happen. Um, and also note that chain reaction, obviously I was talking about palm oil as, as, a, as a platform from which we can build and we'd absolutely agree so with that in mind I thought I would sort of chart the um chart a little bit chart the path of the campaigning and how that's been responded to through the work uh, next slide please so just to keep it sort of very simple you know I think the camp you know, so much of what we do is is driven by campaigning so you think about you know from about 2011 all the campaigning was very much just targeting the whole industry and you know that's where boycott palm oil message was very strong and what we found in our work was to have to how do you tackle that at such sort of scale and the um you know the way is to break it down like any problem break it down into chunks and one is through a policy commitment is to basically transparently you have to find out where the problems are and a lot of that work was focused on the refinery level could be in the upstream and with that responsibility of opening things up and what you did find then is the campaigning became much more focused and whether it be in geographies whether it's you know the corporate groups that supply groups of pro with problems and specific topics and through that you then see the response that you know rather a, a transactional response saying well either you remove that supplier or you fix them in some way and i think you can argue there was a, a mixed success in how that's gone and what you then see, I think, with the monitoring and measuring is, is supply chain actors taking more responsibility for the overall supply chain and understanding how, how non-compliant they are. I think then at the same time, you can start to see the, uh, the sort of slight rebalancing of the campaigning to other commodities as well. And maybe not as a consequence or maybe, or just in parallel, this sort of understanding of the interconnectedness of problems and the need to look beyond palm. And that's where landscape, jurisdictional, approach comes in and then that sort of brings us to kind of where we are today with the supplier over supply now chain reaction aren't the only people talking about this issue and you know i think it's it's critical that we consider what the, how that gets responded to and there's different ways you know the, the brands we work with do that but i think the message is that what where we get to today is and the key word there is prioritized how do we prioritize the actions that any one supply chain actor or groups of supply chain actors can take to you know to achieve progress next slide please 
Oh, that's not my next slide. <laughs> no, we got mixed up. Uh... Ah, can you move to the next one? Sorry, it, they've got in the wrong order. This one, please. Yeah. So I was going to just first of all um, deal with the those challenges. Now, Chris touched on them as well, but how this was the you know, conversations I've had with the companies we work with and things we've observed. So very quickly, the first thing is within our own supply chain, it's already hard enough what we've done so far and what we still have to do. Um, but what we'd observe is, you know, solutions often, they have to be cross commodity. That's where the, that's why a landscape approach exists because of the reality on the ground. But also observe again that people making corporate group commitments, which actually are quite widespread, effectively becomes a cross commodity approach. Then supplier resistance. So even if a brand wants to do it, many of their suppliers will have quite rigid palm related policies. But what we see, and again, Chris has made some reference to, is that there has been flexibility and a preparedness to act. We also observed that where those suppliers in, you know, involved or have their own NDP policies, even if they are just for palm, they do become more receptive to looking cross commodity. Next one, supplier due diligence gets weaker at each tier. Obviously, the further away the brand is, the harder it is to influence. But we do see that changing. You know, transparency and the monitoring that we see does help that. It does allow brands to have that more direct connection to people on the ground. So that helps. And they might not be able to enforce that policy word by word, but they can message, you know, send that message about the key things and you know, we can't see deforestation in our, in our supply chains. We've touched on this with poor traceability of the commodities. It's no doubt now that most of the commodities don't have the level of traceability that Palm does. Um, but that's where, to Chain Reaction's point, you know, Palm can be that role model. We, this is where we were 10 years ago. Why, why not for other industries? Um, it was also pointed out to me that you know that the EU regulations and the science-based targets do actually provide a leverage point to, to force some more transparency because obviously they cover other commodities than Palm. This is an interesting one, reflecting on um, why we're here today. There is still a perceived lack of pressure. You know, there aren't a lot of voices in it, and it's pretty much only coming from, um, from the NGO campaigning space. So if there was that more consistent pressure, most companies, most actors, anything, don't want to do things unilaterally, but they will act en masse when, when it happens across the board. So that is a definite possibility. Um, and supply chain pressure on procurement, you know, I think at the moment there's a real sense that supply chains generally are very under pressure and no procurement department wants to reduce the amount of um, supplies they can access. Um, but as I was saying here, always been the case. And, we, you know, you have to keep pressing against and press the case for you need to be buying from responsible suppliers, not just supply. And, and they need to be from sort of responsible sourcing regions. And that is definitely the focus of a lot of the work on the ground now. So, Kaj, can we go back to the previous slide? Thanks. So here's the opportunities as I see, as we see them in Earthworm. And one of obviously is on policy, just like we did with NDPE. Even if there's some fear that you're not in a position to deliver on that policy, it sets direction. It's worth making that policy statement and it enables those discussions with, with your suppliers on your expectations. And as I said, it's essentially and add on to existing corporate group um, policies anyway. Grievance, having a robust grievance approach. Um, again, thinking about the supplier over the supply, you know, grievance approaches are very driven by, you know, the reputational impact and you don't want to be associated with certain companies. Um, and that's where you should prioritise those most serious cases. You know, Chris was referencing uh, the mining case that we we're well aware of, another one, another case in Sarawak and Companies make a judgment about they don't want to be associated with those issues. Um, I just want to just touch on as well, there's obviously things happening in satellite monitoring now um, that Earthworm is well involved with our Starlink system, but the CDF is an interesting uh, methodology with a monitoring response framework that maybe you're aware of um, that is initially focused on Palm, but it is intended to look beyond Palm. And it's also the way it works is to look beyond the narrow confines of known Palm supply chains. The other bit I want to just touch back on is, is the landscape solution, which is slightly different to what um, you know, Chris has been talking about, but it, it is essentially a cross commodity approach. And you know, the, the first step in that would be to understand your responsibility and uh, Rainforest Action Network have, have defined a methodology for 
calculating your forest footprint, we'd encourage companies to consider that as a way of understanding where your risk is. And then you can go and find one of the many landscape programs that are either in inception or you know fully running now. So I just want to finish with my final slide. There's also two slides on Kyle. It's just to just to share my point about the landscape. So we have a landscape in Riau, and I'm picking this one particularly because it's very focused on you know the two major commodities in that region, pulp paper and palm oil. And uh, I won't go to all the detail of what's on this slide, but you can see the vision there, and it is about creating a, a responsible um, sourcing landscape, and that that is inevitably focused on um, the communities that live there, the smallholders, the agreement with the the government on how land should be used and you know that the companies involved in pulp and paper and palm and any other um, commodity you know are responsible and and meet um, and meet com um, people's policy commitments so that's definitely where we see the focus and that's my last slide so uh, so thanks very much for the time over to you kyle Great, thanks Rob and to all of our other speakers uh, for providing their insights on today's presentation. Um, getting to questions and I'm seeing a few related to uh, the Malacca case that you talked about, Chris. Um, maybe you and Okita could uh, share a few more details about how Aid Environment worked with other NGOs in Indonesia to uh, get the results that you did and kind of walk through you know the process you're thinking for how to approach uh, companies and players in this market to adopt or you know take on cross commodity uh, policies that would prevent deforestation yeah sure thanks carl um so that case came about just by routine monitoring of a, a new development in Sulawesi and then the um, permit information and the satellite imagery was um, complemented uh, by field investigations by a local NGO in Sulawesi um, and then that was passed to uh, palm oil buyers that we had a relationship with um, and we advocated that um, this would violate the NDP policy and then it was backed up with um, information that came from the field about the, the habitat and the, the people that were using that um, area of forest, um, the particular biodiversity of the area is very uh, sensitive um, area because of the rocks in Sulawesi um, and, and the way that the water was retained by the forest. Um, so it was not only just satellite imagery and so the information that we had that was quite dry and which you can get from from different sources. It was also backed up by information from the field and then that was given to the buyers that had a relationship with um, the supplier United Malacca. And then it was just um, a series of meetings explaining why this would violate the policy. And really, that's all it is. It's, it's, it's engagement between a supplier and a buyer about the issue, usually backed up by a consultant who a firm works with different companies. There's lots of different consultancies out there that support buyers in this process. And it's just providing all the information that's necessary, making the supplier, the company aware of the uh, consequences of, of what they're planning on doing and providing the buyer with the information they need so that they can sort of um, go into these kind of meetings fully informed and that they have um, a partner that can verify any information that they that was given back to them. And then in this, in this case, there was a, a positive outcome and that has been replicated in other cases, but it's always a collaborative process that comes from the consultancies and the consultancies are really important, you know, organizations like Earthworm that are sort of supporting these companies um field information that will usually come from NGOs and um and then companies committed to implementing their policy great thank you um next question I think I will direct towards Herard uh we had a question looking at your reference to successful cross-community initiatives 
and they're interested in how do we define successful when looking at cross commodity initiatives um, at the end of the day you know what do we want to see that will advance the field forward Gerard, uh, you might be in mute Yes, sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think that the, the the answer that Chris just gave uh, um, on the on the earlier question is already an an, an, an indication of how what 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 successful can mean, um, and so that uh, uh, downstream companies are getting informed that they understand that uh, they are sourcing palm oil. Or kernel, uh, or kernel palm oil uh, from uh, from uh, um, from companies which are uh, uh, still uh, um, deforesting in other activities than palm. That that is, and when it gets on on the grievance list, and when there is attention for it, that that is what we have seen here as initial successful steps. But yeah, that that is just not enough because there are still many others which are neglected and yeah that's one of the reasons that we have this uh, this report and we have this webinar great thank you uh turning back to rob um maybe you could answer this question what are some current best practice tools to trace supply chains across various tiers and the follow-up question to that is uh how important is it that midstream suppliers disclose their suppliers in order to enable multi-tier transparency well it's it's just absolutely critical and in terms of tools uh i mean we've been working on the traceability side of things for most of the years that we've been involved with palm oil and it's it's not a high-tech solution it's just a process of gathering the data and today there is very good data in palm that you know and i think the other thing to note as well is is the sort of the key leverage points in a supply chain so in palm we know that a refinery in the producing country is an important sort of commercial hub and and kind of the 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 unit of measurement on the main unit in the palm is is the palm oil mill because that then then gives you that connection and what you do then find is you know we we got that to that level quite quickly and then it became very difficult to to go to that next step of mapping out all the plantations so in terms of like the midstream player i mean there is there's still lots of gaps in the the midstream and just the way that a power industry works and i'll say this is without even thinking about other commodities um so always looking to try and fill those gaps um but in the end the most important thing is to get to the ground and particularly thinking about um you know, the fact we've got satellite monitoring solutions out there now that means once you can find where it's from on the ground then you can watch it and that's, that's vital and that will be even more vital now with the the arrival of the eu regulations on deforestation free um so i without having an absolute definitive answer i can see those sort of monitoring solutions being critical and they're going to have to become more robust people because the, the data is going to have to be provided when it comes to issues other than deforestation, then it becomes, I can't go into it now, it goes into far, far more complicated because it, it's the identification on the ground that's still so hard to do at scale. Yeah, uh, I imagine we could have a full webinar uh, to have you <laughs> that topic, but uh, the EU regulations and uh, SPTI and other really regulations being proposed in the US and UK are definitely having people, you know, be more aware and proactive, hopefully on this front. Uh, turning to the next question, uh, Chris, maybe you could step in. Um, since most of the companies within DPE policies are members of the RSPO, uh, what should we see the role of RSPO being in the cross commodity policy discussion? Thanks. Yeah, there was another question about a uh, comparison to the FSC's policy of association. Um, the, the RSPO will only adjudicate on anything to do with with palm oil that's always been a frustration with them um with the membership rules a few years ago that anything that wasn't was outside of the palm oil sector they just wouldn't adjudicate on it um and that the scope of their operations are palm oil so 
I don't see that changing. It's understandable, as frustrating as it is. The RSPO is also a membership-led voluntary organization, so any changes in the RSPO have to be driven by members. And if, if companies, company members wanted the RSPO to sort of adjudicate on this, they could they would have to push it themselves to get the RSPO on board. Um, I, I think it's just the RSPO is always going to say it's outside of the scope of their operations because they are the RSPO and anything to do with non palm oil um, issues, even among RSPO members, um, they just they just won't. If you don't know, we're we're hopeful that they will provide some clarity to the member um, the group uh, company group definition through the complaint system. Um, it's difficult to know how much power they have and what they can enforce, but just the fact that the RSPO, which most reputable company they're a member of, is adjudicating on it and will pass down some kind of judgment, um, that's always useful to have. Um, but I think in terms of this cross-commodity issue, the RSPO will always say it's outside of their scope. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Harar, I'd like to turn back to you for this question. Uh, do fast moving consumer goods companies also have policies for their suppliers to be fully uh, NDPE uh, policy compliant and, and not just for their own demand? So, I'm, I'm taking that as uh, they have no deforestation for the supplier they provide an FMCG, but also an FMCG is looking at their supply to other companies and making sure that that is not uh, tied to deforestation as well. Yeah. Um... No, there are not many, um, and uh, the, 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 the focus of most fast-moving consumer good companies is only on the material that they buy, and they think that they are, uh, when they have done that, then that that is really enough, and um, um, and well, that's also that's also the the, the 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 feedback that they get from many investors. Uh, which are already very happy, and that's what one uh, very crucial uh, investor told me. They are already very happy when a uh, fast-moving consumer good company has everything uh, okay in its NDP policy, so a good policy and a good verification, uh, so a good execution. So then they are already happy with the, when they have it uh, in place in Palm, and do it for one hundred percent, and um, and yeah, and 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 the next step, yeah, that is just uh, it takes time. It takes time. That uh, uh, also uh, based on this kind of uh, of uh, of uh, webinars and reports, that there will be the next next steps. Yeah, there is one company with that we found, and that's Unilever, which has uh, it in its uh, which has this scope issue. Um, in its uh, uh, palm oil policies, and all the others don't have it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so then, this next question, I think, you know, maybe would go to Rob or potentially, you know, Chris or, or Akita. You might be able to answer it. Um, but maybe starting with Rob, but how does Earthworm and others uh, check the no exploitation commitment, other than through the RSPO? Um, how are you monitoring that and, and keeping up to date on that? So I missed the first bit of the question. Can I say that again? Uh, how, how is Earthworm Foundation checking the no exploitation commitment uh, other than through the RSPO? Um, as I said in my previous answer, it's, it's still a, a huge challenge to do that at scale. Um, Pretty much all our field work today is, fo is focused through our landscapes, which we've got all over the globe. Um, it's not an area I work in directly, but you know, I know that you know the um, the as that slide I showed demonstrates. It's uh, there's a multiple de deliverables to a, a landscape and measures that we take, and that would include sort of equitable outcomes for um, you know for for you know. For people who work in palm oil and uh, and the communities as well impacted, um, but I think I think the direction of the question is is all the scale bit, and that's that's very difficult. I, I don't think anyone's reliably answered that one yet. 
great, thank you. Um, Harar, turning back to you, uh, I have a question here. Uh, it states, uh, beyond policy and standards, are there examples of how companies can adopt new business models or practices to adapt to new pressures like cross-commodity traceability and policies? Um, yes, there are. There, there, there are there are alternative business models uh, to uh, to adapt to this and for mm -hmm. instance for instance that is by um uh by uh, buying only palm oil from a company which is only active in palm oil that can be a choice and you can see that already happening um increase i think mars is doing that um or or Mars is, Mars is the case probably that they reduce the number of suppliers. That's another one. So reduce the number of suppliers substantially uh, to get much uh, to, to, to be able to get much more information from that supplier. And yeah, and, and another step is, as I already said, buying palm oil from from a company that's only active in uh, in palm oil without a holding company which is active in other activities. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Okita, I think this question might be best fit for you. Uh, someone was asking, uh, you know, as was mentioned in the presentation, NDPE policies are common in the palm oil sector, Southeast Asia. Um, what are the barriers preventing NDPE policies being adopted in other regions and for other commodity supply chains? Um, an example being minerals or timber um, or you know, NDPE policy or something similar being adopted in South America or other regions? Well, yeah, I think it's more about the, the attention rather than, barriers them, rather than barriers themselves because a lot of attention has been put to palm oil in the past decade. So NDPE policies are more famous in the palm oil sectors. Uh, so that uh, that is how this NDPE policies evolve in the palm oil sector more other than other sectors. Thank you. Great, thank you. I believe that is the end of the questions that we've received uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and joining today's session. Uh, the report uh, that inspired this webinar uh, is available for download on our website. And a special thank you to Rob from the Earth Foundation for joining us today and be uh, on the lookout for an email with a link to the recording of this webinar within the next few days. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar soon. Thank you.